Well, a very good evening and thank you for joining us on India Business Hour. I'm Ashmit Kumar and here are the headlines that we're tracking this evening. About 14 electric vehicle companies which are facing investigations for allegedly misappropriating subsidies are considering stake sales. Companies say the suspension of subsidies have impacted their credit worthiness and banks are not keen on extending working capital loans to them. That's a CNBC TV18 exclusive. Bajaj Auto reports a 12% revenue growth in Q4 even as profits drop over 2%. Margins also beat estimates and the board approves a dividend of 140 rupees per share. Nestle India beats estimates with profits rising nearly 25%. Reports the highest growth rate in a decade even as rising milk prices impact the margins. Company says all product groups deliver double digit growth. The World Health Organization red flags cough syrups made by Punjab-based QP Pharmaceutical for contamination. This is the third instance of an Indian company coming under the scanner. The MD of QP Pharmachem tells CNBC TV18 that the syrups are not contaminated and that he's confident of a clean shit from Punjab drug regulator. Bicon, Biologics and Serum Institute restructure their strategic partnership. Serum will invest a total of $300 million, valuing Biocon subsidiary at $6 billion. Adar Punawala tells CNBC TV18 that he has no plans to increase his stake for the moment. A Silicon Valley bank-like crisis is very unlikely in India, says the finance ministry, adds that the Indian banking system is well-placed to handle any stress arising from interest rate cycles. Day four of pleas seeking legal sanctity for same-sex marriages. Petitioners argue that marriage is an evolving concept and that majority must not be allowed to determine rights of the minority. Petitioners say centre's submissions seem to suggest that there were no LGBT relationships prior to Britishers coming to India. After 10 days of street fighting, Sudan's warring factions agree to a three-day ceasefire. India starts Operation Kaveri to evacuate stranded citizens. The first batch of 278 citizens have left Port Sudan and are headed for Jeddah. Election campaigns intensify in Karnataka. Home Minister Amit Shah defends the scrapping of 4% reservation for Muslims as he continues his roadshows. Congress leader Priyanka Gandhi enters the battleground and attacks the BJP on corruption, accusing the state government of stealing 1.5 lakh crore rupees. U.S. President Joe Biden formally launches his re-election campaign, releases a video asking Americans to give him another four years to finish what he started. Vice President Kamala Harris will be his running mate once again. Well, let's start with the day's market action. A range-bound session on the Lal Street ended with marginal gains. Sensex gained nearly 75 points and the Nifty gained over 25 Nifty Bank Index also eked out marginal gains. Well, several electric vehicle companies facing investigations for allegedly misappropriating subsidies are now considering stake sales. Industry sources tell us that these companies are facing working capital crunch after their subsidies were suspended. Many of them are in talks with investors to dilute their stake. Parikshit Luthra joins us now with more exclusive details. Parikshit, tell us... How grave is the situation? Well, yes, uh, we learned from industry sources that 13 to 14 EV companies, which are in the investigation by Ministry of Heavy Industries for misappropriation of fame subsidies, are considering selling a minority stake. CNBC TV18 has found out that manufacturing operations and working capital requirements of these EV players who have had their sus subsidies suspended are in talks with investors and some of the leading vehicle OEMs in the country. Some are even considering selling a majority stake. The reason for this, according to them, is that subsidies to the tune of 1,400 to 1,500 crores have been on hold and are accumulating over the last 15 months. This withholding of subsidies due to the probe into misappropriation has impacted the credit worthiness of the companies and the affected companies say that banks are not keen to extend working capital loans either. Sources have said that Okinawa is among the companies considering a dilution of stake. The management told us that they are not looking at divesting a majority stake, but are in talks with investors to support expansion plans. 
At the same time, Okinawa and other affected EV companies are in talks with the government to find a solution. The Society for Manufacturers of Electric Vehicles has said that there should be a rationality and practical uh, approach uh, towards government decision-making. They say the government should allow companies to have a fresh start and understand that in 2019, there was no supply chain for EVs in India and companies were forced to import whatever was not manufactured in the country. But net-net, uh, there could be some stake sales this year and 2023 could be a year of consolidation in India's EV market. Well, clearly a developing story, Pariksha. Thanks so much for those details. We'll keep coming back to you for more. And well, speaking of mobility, in just a while, we will tell you how cities are faring when it comes to public transport and shared mobility. We get you more from the findings from the Ola Mobility Institute report in just a bit. Well, moving ahead now, Bajaj Auto's fourth quarter earnings beat expectations. Profit of over 1,400 crore rupees is more than CNBC TV 18's poll, but less than what it reported last year. Margin was higher year on year at 19.3%. Board, meanwhile, has approved a dividend of 140 rupees per share for FY23. Sticking to earnings, Nestle India has beat estimates with profits rising nearly 25% year-on-year. This is the highest growth rate the company has reported in a decade despite the impact of rising milk prices on the margins. Manglam Malu joins us now with more details. Uh, Manglam, take us through the numbers. Well, Nestle reported a bumper first quarter calendar 2023 numbers and that's uh, primarily led by the company's top line which was above straight expectations by a mile. We saw a revenue growth of 21.3% in the company's overall sales and as a result of which it's the highest uh, quarterly growth that the company's posted in their top line in over a decade. Also at the same time the EBITDA at an absolute level and the net profit at an absolute level were much above street expectations. EBITDA just shy of that 1100 crore mark and the net profit a little over 700 crores as well. The reason why the stock did not react uh, strongly on the upside are two. There are two reasons. The first one is that we had already seen a big move in the stock price before the numbers and secondly the margins were a tad below street expectations about 30 40 basis points lower than expectations and 70 basis points below the same time last year as well and that was on account of raw material inflation that we've seen especially in the milk and milk products universe where 30 to 40 percent jump has caused a bit of a dent in the company's gross margins as well the management alluded to demand recovering going forward a volume growth of close to around five odd percent and if you uh, you know discount the low unit packs of maggie the volume growth this time around has been around 11 to 12 percent so strong sales environment the costs they believe that will remain firm especially on the side of milk over the next few quarters Right, Manglam, thanks a lot for that. Now, Tata Consumer reported a strong set of numbers this quarter. Net profit rose above 21%, while revenue grew by 14% in Q4. The company's international beverages revenue grew by 8%, and its overall business in India grew by 15%, with both verticals uh, beating street estimates. However, the company's India food business growth was in line. Well, in the big global earnings, Swiss bank UBS reported its first quarterly earnings after the Credit Suisse acquisition. The bank saw a 52% annual drop in net profit at just $1 billion in the first quarter. Revenue came in at $8.7 billion and operating expenses came in at $7 billion. The drop in net profit was due to increased provisioning following the securities litigation matter. So if you look on, on, on an underlying basis, uh, we had a, a very strong uh, performance. Uh, of course, we, when you compare it to the record quarter of last, first quarter of last year, uh, they are not as good as that. Uh, at this stage, I'm pleased that we are closing a chapter, a uh, 15 years old chapter of our own litigation. We have to be patient a little bit, but of course, we uh, still believe we're going to close this transaction uh, by, um, by the end of this quarter. Well, the World Health Organization has red flagged a cough syrup made by Punjab-based QP PharmaChem for contaminants. This is the third instance of an Indian company coming under the WHO scanner. Uh, the WHO says that it found unacceptable amounts of diethylene glycol and ethylene glycol. Now, as contaminants in the syrups found in Marshall Islands and Micronesia. The MD of QP PharmaChem, Sudhir Patak, told CNBC TV18 that the syrups are not contaminated and that he's confident of a clean shit from Punjab's drug regulator. Patak also claimed that syrups dispatched for Cambodia in 2020 ended up in Australia and were tested by WHO. He also claimed that syrups tested were expired. 
Well, a big story from the deal street. Biocon Biologics and Serum Institute have agreed to restructure their strategic partnership. According to the new terms, Serum will make an additional equity investment of $150 million in Biocon Biologics, taking its total investment to $300 million. Uh, Serum will pick up a 4.9% stake in the Biocon subsidiary. The deal values Biocon Biologics at $6 billion. Now, as per the deal terms, they agreed in 2021, the company was then valued at just under $5 billion. Bicon Biologics will have access to 100 million doses of vaccines annually. It will also get distribution rights to Serum's vaccine portfolio. Bicon's Kiran Mazumdar Shaw and Serum's Adar Punawala spoke exclusively to CNBC TV18 on the reasons for the restructuring, the deal, and the impact it will have on both the companies. There was an original deal that was struck in 2021 about uh, offering a 15% stake in return for, uh, you know, uh, certain financials, financials linked to vaccines. Uh, now, that has been replaced by a straight equity, uh, you know, investment, whereas, you know, Serum had already invested $150 million in Biocon Biologics. And there was a loan that is now being converted into equity, uh, which will add another 150 million and uh, make it an aggregate investment of three, 300 million at an approximate uh, aggregate valuation of 6 billion. So I think that's the change in uh, the, re the, the uh, restructured uh, arrangement that we now have with uh, Serum Institute. This is a 10, 15 year. Uh, um, horizon and vision that we're looking at. It's a 15-year arrangement. So there's plenty of time, you know, to generate um, some good sales, uh, you know, uh, through our other vaccines. And it's not just limited to vaccines that we make. Um, in the strategic partnership, um, if Biocon and or Biologics have uh, opportunities and other vaccines that they find mm. through their uh, network and partners, uh, that they would want us to manufacture, we can manufacture that as well. So the agreement that we have now with them covers, you know, and is not limited to um, uh, all of these uh, sort of uh, opportunities. We've got a profit-sharing arrangement hmm. in the in the in the uh, uh, agreement which um, shares the profits, um, you know, of the of the vaccines uh, that will be made. Well, more action now from the pharma space. IPCA Laboratories is acquiring more than 33% stake in Unichem Labs at 400 rupees per share for over 1,000 crore rupees. The company's board has also approved an open offer of up to 26% additional stake in Unichem Lab. Ekta Batra joins us now with more details. Uh, Ekta, what does this mean for IPCA Labs? Well, yes, uh, the news with regards to IPCA Labs is that they will be buying over 30% stake in Unichem for around 1,034 crores. It will be at around 440 rupees per share, which is a 13% premium to yesterday's closing price. They will be buying an additional 26% uh, via an open offer and that would amount to over 800 odd crores. Now, what Unichem brings to the table for IPCA Labs is that, remember that Unichem did sell its entire domestic formulation business in 2017 to Torrent for around 3,700 crores. Now, they do have their international formulation business, which was with them since 2017, and out of that, 55% of sales were supplies only to the US markets. They do have three formulation facilities, three API facilities, which IPCA will be getting through the transaction and uh, all of this would be with compliant US facilities as well. Now, IPCA, remember, has had trouble with the US markets. They've had three facilities which have been under the US FTA scanner since 2015 and hence this particular acquisition will give them ready access to the market. However, there are a couple of negatives. The business has been growing at low single digits over the last four to five years. When it comes to Unichem, they did incur an EBITDA loss as of nine months, FY23. So the entire transaction might in fact be margin dilutive. Also, one of their arms does have a pending fine from the European Commission as per their annual report. Valuations, annualizing nine months uh, acquisition is done at an enterprise value of around 2.5 times revenue, according to analysts. And the likes of Incred, which is a brokerage, has indicated that the company is paying a high valuation for a loss-making asset. Hence, the deal is expensive.
India's fourth largest pharma company, Mankind Pharma's 4300 crore rupee IPO has opened up for subscription. Uh, the issue will be available for the public uh, to bid till April 27th. At 4326 crore rupees, we caught up with the company's managing director, Rajiv Juneja, uh, at the Mankind Pharma to learn more about the company's plans about listing. Gross margins of Panacea are more than mankind. And once these products will be shifted, manufacturing will shift in our own factories, gross margins will further improve. I'm um, keeping everything in mind. Uh, this is a fantastic kind of a uh, acquisition. Uh, this, is, this is basically I mean, uh, one organization which is not properly, its uh, products are not being properly utilized, exploited to the fullest. We feel uh, we can do wonderful with this. Well, the finance ministry feels that an SVB-like crisis is very unlikely in India as 63% of total deposits owned by households are considered sticky retail customers. In its monthly report, the ministry also said that Indian banks are well-equipped to handle frequent interest rate cycles. Sapna Das joins us with more now. Sapna, take us through the key takeaways. Well, the government has focused on three to four key aspects of the Indian banking system. Number one, of course, uh, the interest rate cycles in India have been extremely prominent. The banks are very well attuned with these interest rate cycles. Uh, they have been a they're very well equipped to handle them. So that's one uh, strong reason for confidence in the Indian banking system. Second, the deposit base, 60% of the bank deposits are held with particular banks where the sovereign is the owner. Second, 63% of such deposits are with the retail customers uh, who are sticking key. So basically a flight of deposits, a massive flight of deposits over here is pretty much improbable. Last but not least, also in terms of the bank exposure to bonds here in India is quite limited. For example, even as far as the HGM category is concerned, RBI stipulation is very clear, not more than 23% of the deposits can be in the held to maturity portfolio. So there are again checks and balances in place over there. Plus, uh, even if you have, uh, you know, the bond yields rising by around 250 basis points as far as the HGM portfolio of banks is concerned, uh, you know, CRAR CR of banks is not going to be hit. You know, there's not going to be any impact. So all these three aspects put together, the government is extremely confident that, uh, you know, an SCB-like collapse in, in the Indian scenario is unlikely to happen and the possibility of a big flood of deposits is totally improbable. Well, to the aviation space now, over 1,500 pilots of Air India have written to Tata Group's chairman emeritus, Ratan Tata. They have urged him to intervene and address their concerns. The pilots allege that they are not being treated with respect and dignity and their concerns are not being heard or addressed by the current HR team. Air India, meanwhile, defended the new contracts. Sources say that the senior management has reached out to employees, saying that flying allowances there are higher than anywhere else in the country. In a separate letter, pilot unions pledged that they would go to any extent if a single employee is sacked for not signing the new contract. An Ola Mobility Institute report highlights that out of 18 cities covered, nine have witnessed a rise in public transport usage between 2018 and 2022. So which cities uh, have the cheapest when it comes to commuting? Where has shared mobility seen the highest adoption? Shivani Bazaar's gets us more answers. OMI Foundation's Ease of Moving Index, India Report 2022, was launched today. The report incorporates responses from 50,000 respondents, 220 focus group discussion participants and data from government and other sources. The report sheds light on the state of mobility across cities in India and suggests that 9 out of 18 surveyed cities have witnessed a rise in usage of public transport between 2018 and 22. According to the report, Pune and Pimpri Chinchwad scored the highest on the ease of moving index, which means the moving around in these cities is the easiest. Nagpur, on the other hand, leads the way in terms of efficient and dependable mobility. Over 70% of respondents from Na Nagpur said that they can reach their workplace within 30 minutes. When it comes to cost of transportation, Mumbaikars are among the lowest spenders on transport per month. But Jabalpur has the lowest mobility expenditure among cities. On the digitization payment front, Hyderabad has an impressive adoption of cashless mobility services, which means you don't need to pay in cash while using transport services in Hyderabad. When it comes to shared transportation, Kolkata has the highest adoption of shared mobility. On the public transport front, Bengaluru has stepped up in terms of reliability of public transport. 
From 2018 to 2022, India's IT hub has seen reliability of public transport increase from 30% to 39%. In Mumbai, the number of public transport users increased from 56% to 84% from 2018. 15 out of the 18 surveyed cities saw comfort level of passengers improve since 2018. From a clean mobility perspective, Aizol in Mizoram emerged as a top performer, while Ahmedabad has the highest willingness to adopt to electrical vehicles. This, in short, is the state of mobility across India. Well, with that, it's time now to slip into a very short break. But coming up, day four of pleas seeking legal sanctity for same-sex marriages. Petitioners argue that marriage is an evolving concept and that the majority must not be allowed to determine rights of the minority. Details when we come back. Welcome back. Now, the Supreme Court heard pleas seeking legal sanctity for same-sex marriages for the fourth day. Petitioners argue that Parliament does not enjoy unfettered rights on the issue of marriage equality. Petitioners also argue that uh, 12 G20 countries have permitted same-sex marriages. I caught up with members of uh, Swikar, a support group for parents of children from the LGBTQIA community. They have sent an open letter to the Chief Justice of India, Justice Chandrachur. The letter states that they desire their children to find legal acceptance for their relationships under the Special Marriage Act. Uh, they also said that they hope to see a legal stamp on rainbow marriages of their children within their lifetime. Even for the parents, you know, uh, they, they understood that this is not a uh, crime uh, because uh, Section 377, it was said that uh, being gay is called criminal. So, um, you know, since that time, after that, we, we had many members, you know, suddenly the members increased after that and during Corona, they increased still more. The Honorable Supreme Court has actually set the ball rolling. Uh, this now is going to have a very large cascade effect and irrespective of what discussions we have, whether we have it in the parliament or not, we are going to see this um, come to fruition where uh, people are going to come out and do what they want to. We want to see uh, a legal stamp on this so that, you know, there are no problems with regard to nomination, with regard to insurance, with regard to, um, uh, you know, property uh, issues. Well, meanwhile, election campaigns have intensified in Karnataka. Home Minister Amit Shah defended the scrapping of 4% reservation for Muslims as he continued his roadshows. Congress leader Priyanka Gandhi entered the battleground and attacked the BJP on corruption, accusing the state government of stealing 1.5 lakh crore rupees. The Congress party ke adhyaks kehte hai ki agar Congress ki sarkar aayi, to Muslim reservation phir se aayega. Main puchna chahta hu Congress party ke adhyaks mahodaj ki aap 4 pratisat Muslim reservation vapis laoge, to kiska kam karoge? वो कलिगा का कम करोगे लिंगायतों का कम करोगे दलितों का कम करोगे या एसटी का कम करोगे या ओबीसी का कम करोगे सबसे ज्यादा दुख की बात तो ये कि ये जो 40% की सरकार चली उसने आपको लूटा बेशर्मी से लूटा और बेरहमी से लूटा भर्तियों में स्कैम हुए पुलिस की भर्तियों में स्कैम हुए तमाम स्कैम हुए लेकिन कहीं किसी भी दोषी को नहीं पकड़ा गया क्योंकि ज्यादातर वो भाजपा से एसोसिएटेड दोषी थे The Supreme Court, meanwhile, has agreed to hear a plea by a wrestler seeking registration of an FIR against BJP MP and Federation Chief Bridge Bhushan Singh over sexual harassment allegations. India's top wrestlers claim that the police refused to file a case despite them submitting a complaint several days ago. This is the second time wrestlers have taken their protests against Singh public in the last four months. Tamil Nadu waters down its liquor permit expansion plan, withdraws the need to procure special licenses to serve alcohol during celebrations, festivals and house parties. Annual registration fees and per day fees will be levied only for serving alcohols at uh, banquets, conventions and conferences. Liquor licenses for clubs and star hotels that were operational before stay in force as well. 
from Tamil Nadu to Kerala, where Prime Minister Modi is on a two-day visit. He flagged off Kerala's first Vande Bharat Express from the state's capital. Speaking at an event, Prime Minister said that just like northeastern states and Goa, Kerala will also accept the BJP soon. After 10 days of street fighting, Sudan's warring factions agree for a three-day ceasefire. India starts Operation Kaveri to evacuate stranded citizens. The first batch of 278 Indians have left Port Sudan and are headed for Jeddah. U.S. President Joe Biden has formally launched his re-election campaign. He has released a video asking Americans to give him another four years to finish what he started. Vice President Kamala Harris will be his running mate once again. At 80, Biden is already the oldest incumbent American president. Well, with that, it's a wrap on this edition of India Business. Uh, thank you so much for watching. News and updates continue right here on CNBC TV 18.